your way out with um, Jessica right here. And it looks like Kendra's coming too. So uh, you can make your way and head downstairs for Children's Church. As we see uh, the cross on the stage with the white hanging on it rather than the purple, it reminds us that we are no longer in the season of Lent, but we are now in the season of Easter. Now that might sound strange just to some of you because you might think, well I thought Easter was like a Sunday, but it is a whole season and it goes uh, from last Sunday all the way up through Pentecost. And has been our custom, we have been following through these church seasons, and we typically do beginning in Advent, and we go through Epiphany, and into Lent, and into the season of Easter, and sometimes we follow it all the way through Pentecost, and other times we pause and we do a book study. And as we did last year, you guys might remember, we studied the book of Genesis together last year after Easter. We're going to be studying today the book of Ephesians. And uh, not just today, but for the next several months as we, as we go through uh, this, this, um, this book, this letter. And, and so I want to give you kind of a rundown this morning of where we're going over the next several months, really. Uh, for the next six weeks, we're going to be studying the first three chapters in the book of Ephesians. So that's how we're going to spend six weeks on three chapters. That's a fairly moderate pace uh, going, going through there. And then on May the 19th, we're going to pause in our series on the book of Ephesians. And we're going to celebrate as a church together the work that God has allowed me to accomplish uh, through Northern Seminary uh, with a doctorate program there. And we've got the president of Northern coming down on that Sunday, May the 19th. We're going to have a lunch after church. We'll be in one combined service that day. You'll love to hear him preach too. He's a Scottish guy, has the Scottish accent, and is a lot of fun uh, to listen to, but a great guy, Alistair Brown. He'll be down here. He'll be preaching that Sunday. We're also going to be celebrating that Sunday my 20th year of ordination. Now, I know that's hard to believe, right? But in 1993, I was ordained, and so this September, I'll have been in ministry for 20 years, right? Long time. After that, we're going to resume our study in the book of Ephesians. And I said the first three chapters before that. And then after that, we'll be moving into chapter 4. And toward the end of chapter 4, Paul is really talking about what it means to live in Christ, to be in Christ. He speaks of a new creation. We are a new creation. And so he, he talks about um, new clothes that we wear. We look different because we're Christians, right? And, and we should look different than everybody else in the world. So we're going to unpack that. And we're going to slow down quite a bit throughout the summer as we really hit on these characteristics of what it means to live in Christ. How are we different now that we are in Christ? And then toward the middle of August, and again this could change, you know how it goes as we start developing this out, but here's the plan. Toward the end of August, Paul moves into very practical advice, very practical uh, kinds of things toward the end of Ephesians. He talks about relationships. You, you might remember Ephesians chapter 5, you hear it at weddings sometimes, right? About a husband and a wife. He talks about our children and how we raise our children. And so it's going to get very practical. And we're going to move into this series on relationships. And, and then toward the middle of September, we'll probably come to a close. Uh, so between now and somewhere in September, maybe even October, we are going to be in Ephesians. And I would encourage you to kind of follow along. You can follow on the website. Uh, usually every week I blog about what we're going to be talking about, give you the, the scripture reference. You can read through it ahead of time and come prepared and worship. Uh, to, to engage it together. So this week, rewinding, we're back in Ephesians chapter 1 this Sunday. And before we dive into the, to the book, I, I want to give you just a little bit of background because if you're going to study a book in the Bible, you need at least some background, right? About who's writing this and who, who is he writing it to. And if you look in these ancient church letters, it's very easy to identify the author of the letter. Like we put the author at the end of the letter, right? You've got to flip all the way through it to the back, you know, but they put the author in the front. So very early on, those of you who have your Bibles already open to Ephesians, who is the author of Ephesians? Paul, exactly, along with many other letters in the New Testament. Paul writes th the letter to the Ephesians. And, and, and who is the letter written to, right? No brainer here, right? The church at Ephesus, you, you might say. But 
And did you realize that some of the early manuscripts of this letter do not have that phrase to the church at Ephesus? And that's kind of curious, isn't it? Why would it be left out in some of the manuscripts? And most scholars have said this is very likely a circular letter that Paul is writing. Now, it's not that he writes it in a circle. It's that he, he writes it not just to one church, but he writes it to be distributed to the other church and the next church and the next church. So very likely Paul's intent in writing this letter was to write to many churches churches throughout Asia Minor. And some scholars believe that, that people would, that as the letter was redistributed to another church, that they left off the, to the church at Ephesus because they wanted them to say, it was not just for the church at Ephesus, it's also for this church. And, and like much of scripture, it reminds us that these letters are not just for one church in time and history. It's for churches throughout Asia Minor. It's for churches throughout the whole world. It's for you and me at First Baptist Church Muncie also, right? So Paul is writing this letter to the church at Ephesus and to other churches also. Now, open your Bibles, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 1. And, and the first two verses here, as you see in other verses uh, throughout the New Testament, are uh, kind of a common greeting. So we're going to kind of move past them this morning, just kind of the greeting. And when we get to verse 3 this morning... We're diving into this letter or this thanksgiving or this prayer that Paul has for the church. And you see this is a common pattern this morning. And we're just going to walk through it together. It's a powerful scripture. And we're going to unpack kind of each of the phrases this morning that Paul lays out for us. Paul is writing this morning, again, as we're reading this, we are the gathered body at First Baptist Church Muncie, right? And we're reading this and we're asking ourselves the question, why do we come here on Sunday mornings? Why are we gathered together? Why do we worship this morning? We have to ask ourselves that question, right? And when we, when we say that, we say, well, we come together to praise God, right? Some of you might say that if we ask the question. I mean, we were here to praise God this morning. Well, what, what does that mean to, to praise God? Many of you say, well, we, we, we thank God for all that he's given us, right? And, and some of us might say, well, we, we thank God for life, for breath, for provision, for our families, for our health, for all of these sorts of things. That's why we gather together to offer praise to God for those things. And that's appropriate that we would do that. We should gather together. But what about those of us who may not have a lot to be thankful for? What if we don't have good health? What if we don't have the provision that others have? What if we don't have these perceived blessings material-wise? Material should we still worship God? Yes, certainly we should worship God. And in many ways, our worship really should move beyond our individual thanksgiving, shouldn't it? It should really be a, a thankful heart, not just for the material things that God has given us, but for the spiritual blessings that God has given us, right? And no matter who you are, you can come into this place this morning and you can thank God for what we're going to talk about in just a few minutes. So this morning, we're in Ephesians chapter 1. And we read in verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every, every what? Spiritual blessing in Christ. So see the difference there? Paul's not just talking about the blessings that we have material wise, right? Or health wise, or individual wise. He's talking about spiritual blessings here. And then he says, all right, let me show you this. He says, praise be to the God and Father. Now the ESV translation interprets this, blessed be the God and Father. So it's kind of interesting. I like that word blessed because we are blessing God for the ways in which he has blessed us, right? And particularly blessing him for the, for the spiritual things he's done for us. Now we, we say, why do we worship? Why do we gather together? M many of us say at times we worship God for who he is and for what he has done, right? And so we, we might say, God is worthy of our worship even if he doesn't do anything for us, right? God's worthy of our worship just because he's God. But 
Paul this morning is going to unpack that second part, what he has done for us. So we're kind of landing on that piece this morning. We're talking about this morning what God has done for us more than just surface level stuff. You know, he's given us a house or he's given us blessings or he's given us health. We're talking about what God has done for us on a spiritual level, on a deep level this morning. So look at verse 4. This is what God has done for us. And I want to back up here because we get this summary verse. It prays be to the God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. This is kind of the summary this morning. And then we're going to unpack the rest of this. This is, what, this, this is unpacking the blessings that God has given to us. Look at verse 4. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. He, in love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. This um, week I emailed this text out to you. Some of you got that. Florence Arnold respo responded back to me, Tim. She said, this scripture is enough to make you a Presbyterian, isn't it? <laughs> so, yeah. You know, time is a tricky thing, isn't it? I mean, we live in time. We're, we're bound by time. It's hard for us to think in terms of outside of time, isn't it? Or especially before time begins, right? But God exists outside of time. He is not bound by time. And Paul reflects on the fact that before the creation of the world, God chose us. You see, God's work in us wasn't a whimsical decision. You know, that he just decides on a whim. He's planned it out. In fact, Paul says he planned it out before the beginning of time. It was his plan all along, Paul says. Now, what did God choose for us before the world began? He says he chose us to be holy. Now, that's similar to what Peter says. Look at what Peter says in 1 Peter 1. Peter says, just as, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it's written, be holy because I am holy. So, so God is holy and we are to be holy. God has chosen us to be holy. Paul looks at it from a different point of view. Peter says, look, be holy. But Paul says, look, God's chosen you to be holy since before, since before the world began. Peter also writes in verse 2, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit for obedience to Christ Jesus and sprinkling by his blood grace and peace be yours in abundance. Peter uses the same language here. It may be hard for us to wrap our minds around this. If, if we're predestined, does that mean we don't have a choice, you might ask? Now there's a debate about this and it's been going on for centuries. Okay, so there's no, no easy answer to this. But the fact is simply that scripture tells us that God chose us. We cannot deny that fact. Now, now how does that work out? And how does that fit with our choice? Good question, right? What Paul wants us to understand here though is that we didn't find God and choose him. He found us and chose us. And this is the appropriate way that we should look at it. Now if we think about it, it should incite worship in us when we truly get this, that God chose us. Have you ever been chosen for anything? Or not chosen? Maybe you remember in the schoolyard playing kickball. We used to do this, right? You line everybody up on a, on a wall or in a, in a straight line and you choose team captains. <laughs> and then the team captains get to choose their team, right? And it feels pretty good if you're one of the first ones chosen. It feels pretty lousy, doesn't it, if you're the last one standing there. I guess I'll take him, right? <laughs> but to be chosen by God is an astonishing thing, isn't it? For God to pick us, to choose us. And if we could get our heads around this, it would change how we see God. God is not one of many alternatives that we choose. Paul says, God chose us. And he did so before the foundation of the world. And we could go on and on and debate how this works out. I think that the whole issue of time and space is something beyond our understanding. I think it's a mystery how this all works out. How can God choose us and at the same time we be able to respond in choice? I think that's a mystery. I don't think we can wrap our heads around that. 
But I believe it's appropriate posture to understand that God chose us. Not only are we chosen by God, look at verse 7. We are redeemed by God. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Wow, this is rich here. This is, this is deep, but it's rich. Well, what does it mean to be redeemed? I mean, we, we don't quite get this too often because we don't live in a culture where, where slavery is a part of our culture, right? I mean, not to say there is slavery in the world today, but we don't live in a world where we see it all the time. But you see, in the Old Testament narrative, in the Old Testament understanding, there was this understanding that the people of God were enslaved, right? And God comes in and God rescues them. He redeems them. Do you remember the Passover? He paints the blood on the doorpost, right? And because of that, they are redeemed. They are rescued out of slavery and they're set free. Same imagery here, but this time the blood's not on the doorpost. The blood is Jesus' shed blood for us. We're redeemed through his shed blood for us on the cross and we are set free. The shackles of sin no longer bind us, you see. And as many of us think, well, we don't have shackles, right? We're, we don't have that. I don't know. You think about sin, it binds us, doesn't it? It holds us down. And there would be some, I think, if we kind of opened up the podium this morning and said, come up here and share your story, you would share about the shackles of sin in your life, right, that have been broken by Christ. And this imagery here of being redeemed, that's what Paul's talking about. Imagine for just a minute the horror of slavery. The horror of captivity. And now you've been set free through the blood of Christ. Now let's keep going here. Look at verse 9. And he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment. To bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. And I was joking, I was telling my family this week, I, I use this, um, um, this software that when I speak, it types things on a screen. I use it to prepare my sermons. And in a few weeks, we're really going to delve into this whole deal with the mystery of Christ, the mystery of Christ revealed. And so in this sermon I was doing this week, um, I had to keep saying that word mystery. And in my southern accent, I just say mystery, right? I don't say mystery, and it kept typing it, M-I-S-T-R-Y. <laughs> so I have to say mystery, right? The mystery of Christ has been revealed. What Paul's saying here is that since the beginning of time, these things that God has been up to, it's been hidden. And we're going to get into this in just a few weeks. I mean, we're going to land on this, spend a whole week talking about this. And Paul says, even the angels drop their jaws, right, at what God is doing. Because the mystery, it's been hidden in the past. And now it's been revealed. You see in the, in the language here in the scripture, for the time has come. It's now, Paul says. The mystery has been revealed. This bird's eye view of all that God's been doing throughout all of history, it has now been brought together. And God is now bringing all things in heaven and earth together, he says. Look at verse 11. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. Do you see what Paul's getting at here? God's been doing this deal, Paul says, since before time began. He's been working. He's been moving. He's been planning. And you and me, we're a part of this plan. We're chosen by God to be a part of this deal. Look at how Paul puts it. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. You know, a lot of people argue and debate about this whole deal as to whether or not we were predestined and how this all works out. And if some people are predestined, it must mean that other people are not. And so we throw our hands up and conclude, you know, there's really nothing we can do about it. This is the wrong angle, I believe, to look at this. The most appropriate way to look at it is that those of us who have heard the gospel and have responded to the good news that we've received it, we are included in this deal. Is there anybody here this morning that, that, that was adopted as a, as a kid? It's a few of you, several of you, yeah. Now think about this. Many times when you're a kid running around, you don't realize you've been adopted, do you? You just know it's your mom and dad. But you 
one day find out you were adopted, right? Now, what does that mean? What do you feel when you feel that? It wasn't that you, like, said, I'll, I'll sign up for this family, right? <laughs> you found yourself in that family, right? And, and you realize that one point in time, before you even knew about it, your parents chose you. You see, that's what Paul's saying here. We, we wake up and one day we realize God's brought us into the family, right? And it's not about us trying to figure out who's in and who's out. If we're in the family, we're in the family. And that's what Paul is talking about here. Now, we do receive this grace... And Paul speaks of responding to this grace. So there's a part of it where we are in this deal and we believe, we are responding to it. But God's grace, Paul says, is something that chooses us. Again, it's like the adopted child who finds out one day that his parents adopted him. You know, it's just how it works out. No longer though, when we view it from this angle, do we feel entitled to it? You see the difference there? If it's something that, that we picked out for us, we, we kind of feel like, well, we chose that, right? But if it's something that chose us, we, we see it more as a gift. You know what I'm saying? You see, Paul uses the word gift and grace over and over again. I challenge you, take the first chapter of Ephesians and count how many times Paul uses the word gift or grace in that chapter. You see, it's a different way. It's not something that we, God's, God's, you know, there's many alternatives out there and I just chose Jesus. It's not how it works out. God, God chose us and it's a gift. And we're glad we're part of the family. Now, stay with me here. I know this is getting kind of deep, but let's hang in there because this is good stuff. Look at verse 13. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Now here again is our response. You and I have believed. We've trusted. We are a part of the family and we have trusted. We were chosen by God but we, are, we have responded in belief. In the past though, God was working through the nation of Israel. You know the whole story. And he had chosen them to be his people, right? And the Gentiles, those who Paul is writing the letter to, this church at Ephesus, the church is in Asia Minor, and you and me, we're Gentiles. We're not Jewish, right? And Paul is saying to all of us, we are included in the deal here. And we've responded. And how do we know this? Paul says that we're marked with a seal. Now, think about this for a minute. And it's interesting, this word seal. You know, what's a seal? Well, the word in Greek is the same word that's used to describe the way in which they sealed the tomb of Jesus. So on the one hand, it's kind of like this thing when God has re rescued us and redeemed us, he sealed us, like he's sealing a tomb, okay? But on the other hand, so it's protection, but on the other hand, uh, a seal also has to do with being certified for something. I, I don't know... How many of you have one of these? You probably would be embarrassed like me to pull it out and show your picture, right? Driver's license, right? I have a daughter who's 16. She's in the nursery today, so I guess I can talk about her. Um, but she's wanting to get one of these pretty soon. Now, she physically could get in a car right now, crank it up and pull down the street. I don't know what kind of damage she might do, but she would do that. She could do that, right? But she would not be certified by the state of Indiana to operate a motor vehicle, right? You see in the middle of this license there's a seal there. What's that seal? It's the seal of the state of Indiana that says I can drive a vehicle. You see? So the seal has to do with like the sealing of the tomb, right? The protective cord kind of thing. But it also has to do with a certification. You see? We are certified by the Holy Spirit. We are marked with the seal this morning. That's what Paul is getting at here. And, and stick with me here. Look what he says here. In verse 14. The Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Now I know this just gets a little, little deep here, but, but what's a deposit? What's a deposit on something? You're going to rent maybe a rental unit? Bob, you put down a deposit, right? And what does that deposit do? It assures that you're going to fulfill your promise, right? You're going you're to take care of the place. You're going to rent and eventually pay rent. And, and when you leave, if you don't take care of the place or you don't pay your rent, you don't get your deposit back, right? That's what a deposit is. 
When people get married here in this building, they put down a deposit on the building. We give it back to them as long as the building's taken care of, right? And as long as things haven't been destroyed. You see, that's what a deposit is. A deposit is a promise. It's something that you say, I'm going to put this down now, but it, it, it's a promise that one day I will fulfill the rest of the deal. You see? And so God has put a deposit down on you and me. He's given us the Holy Spirit. And what does that mean? God says, I promise I'm going to finish my work in that person. Right? And he's given us the Holy Spirit. Now, how many of you would say, God's finished with me now? I, I'm, as, I'm, as, I'm as great and wonderful as I'll ever be because God's done with me. Right? You know what's old bumper sticker? God's not finished with me yet. Right? All of us know that. But God's put a deposit down on us. <laughs> and God says, one day, I'm going to finish this person. I'm going to finish the work that I've started in them. Certainly we're redeemed. I'm not saying we're not redeemed. I'm saying that one day though we will be glorified. One day we will be made holy, perfectly holy as he is holy. Now we're working toward that. We're in the middle of that right now. But one day God's going to finish his promise. And God doesn't neglect his deposit, does he? God's not going to break the contract. We know that throughout history, God has been the kind of God who fulfills his promises. Whew, all right. <laughs> Maybe you feel like you had a fire hose this morning. I admit this morning, I was a little nervous about this sermon. I was a little nervous because it's so deep. I mean, there's so much stuff there. But it's rich, isn't it? And if we can grab hold of it, when we come to the table this morning, it brings a whole new light on it, doesn't it? A whole new light on his blood shed for us. What does his blood shed for us mean? It means what we just said. I'm going to ask you to throw that last slide back up there, Will, if you can do that. It may take him a minute to get, get to that. I want you to see these four things again. We are chosen by God. We're chosen by God to be redeemed. We have redemption in him. And this redemption in him... It's a mystery that's been unveiled that, that before the beginning of time God had planned but he has unveiled through Jesus. How is this redemption taking place? It's taking place through Jesus' shed blood on the cross for your sin and for my sin. And when we respond in faith we are marked with a seal. The Holy Spirit. God says to us you are redeemed I am working on you, but one day I'm going to finish this work in you. And one day you're going to be glorified. You see, that's the whole deal here. I don't know about you. I don't know where this finds you this morning. Maybe for some of you, you're going, wow, I never really got all that. I never really understood all that. I really thought of it that way. But this morning, you're invited to respond in faith. You know, don't get too caught up on whether or not you were chosen by God. You see, if you're chosen by God, if you respond in faith, it is evidence that you are, you are chosen by God. It is evidence that the seal, this Holy Spirit is in you and living in you. So this morning, maybe this morning you're here, this morning you're going, you know, I'd love to be a child of God. I'd love to wake up one day and go, I was adopted by the king. This morning you have an opportunity to do that. You're invited this morning to respond to that. To respond to this grace that's given to you. And I'd invite you as I'm standing down front in just a minute. If that's a, something that you want to be a part of. You, you join me down front. And you say, you know, I, I want that. I want that in my life. Maybe this morning there's something that God's doing in your heart. And you need to pray. And you just want to do that at the altar and do it alone. You come down and you kneel. And you pray during this time of response. And then as we are done with our time of response. Uh, we're going to come to the table together. And we're going to act out this whole deal. His body broken for us. His blood shed for us. As another reminder of all that he's done for us. Let's stand together and sing.